Okay. Uh, my name is Andrea Lieber from Dickinson College, and uh, at Dickinson, where I work, we've been fortunate to uh, have funding from the Posen Foundation for the past six years. It's a delight to be here and an extreme pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Naomi Seidman. Uh, professor Seidman is the Corrit Professor of Jewish Culture and Director of the Dinner Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Theological Union. Her first book, A Marriage Made in Heaven, The Sexual Politics of Hebrew and Yiddish, is the first book-length exploration of the sexual politics underlying the marriage of Hebrew and Yiddish. And it has profound implications for understanding the centrality of language choices and ideologies in the construction of modern Jewish identity. Professor Seidman's other books include Faithful Renderings, Jewish-Christian Difference, and the Politics of Translation, and her translation of The First Day and other stories by Dvorah Barron. Uh, Professor Seidman is a member of the Posen Foundation's Academic Advisory Committee, and she is a marvelous and wonderful uh, teacher, and I think you're really going to enjoy what you're about to hear. Thank you so much, Andrea, and Myrna, and Felix, and everyone else, Laura. Um, I should say that one of the effects of, of this foundation's work in Jewish secularism is that we have gotten to know each other's work very intimately and each other's ideas and there been, there's been some real intellectual collaboration, which is another way of saying that we steal each other's ideas. And um, if David Beale wasn't sitting here, I might not have to say that I really owe a debt of gratitude to his, uh, the chapter in Eros and the Jews, which is called Eros and Enlightenment. Um, but since he's sitting right there, I can't get away with not saying that. So thank you for that. Um, and, and, and maybe one more uh, uh, qualification about this slideshow, which I should say I just put together, is that this slideshow is full of images from the late 19th, really early 20th century, which is where all the images are. And I'm talking about events that happened about 100 years earlier. Or So you just have to sort of think back. When you look, I found an image of something, but I'm really talking about something that happened 100 years earlier. But I know you can do it, because I can already tell that this is a very smart and talented crowd. Um, so but I just figured you would like to have something to, to, uh, to look at. Um, now, we've just been hearing about what some people call metaphysical secularization. So the secularization of thought and how um, people come to think differently about the cosmos and about God and about Jewish identity. And this is the kind of slow, invisible, gradual, dialectical process that you've just heard very beautifully outlined. Um, but it really has... Uh, not that much to do with what we're about to talk about, which is Jewish practice. And when you talk about Jewish practice, you're really talking about um, visible, often abrupt, dramatic, traumatic uh, transformations. And I'll show you some slides of what I'm talking about. In the moment when somebody cuts off their payas, or takes the shaitel off and stops wearing a wig, or eats their first bacon cheeseburger, or in other words, these are not things that, processes that we're talking about that, that take 500 years of slow, uh, gradual transformation. These are dramatic and visible changes that I'm going to be talking about. Um, um, in this particular talk, which is really about Jewish practice. Um, so here's an example of a bourgeois family. This again, this is from the uh, early 20th century. We don't have a ton of photographs from earlier. And you can see, you know, the, the grandfather of the family with the beard and the father without the beard. So you can already see a kind of range of different practices, different clothing styles. Um, and it's this sort of thing that I'm talking about when I think about um, secularization and sexuality, a change of Jewish style. Um, and because these changes are, um, because there are some misperceptions about these changes, I'll just talk about two misperceptions um, uh, about Jewish secularization. And the first one is that we're talking about the abandonment of Jewish law, of halakha. So we're not talking about the abandonment of Jewish law entirely. We're talking about something very different. In other words, one way of conceptualizing Jewish secularization as practice is that first people are keeping Jewish law, and then they're not. 
This is sometimes called the sort of sub subtractionist view of secularization. There used to be something, and now there's nothing. And that's really, if you were going to say that that was the case, and you would say first people were wearing all kinds of interesting clothes, and then they were wearing nothing. Now, clearly, these people are wearing something. What is this something? That's what I'm talking about. It's not nothing. And you can say this about Jewish secularization in general. It's not nothing. It's not the absence of halakha. It's, let's say, a new style. What is this style? You can say it's a kind of more European style. It's more acculturated. But you can also say that there's something distinctively Jewish even about this acculturation, even about this acculturated style. And one of the sort of joint collaborative projects we have in the Posen Foundation is what is secular Jewish? Is it just people who, let's say, genetically look Jewish but dress like everyone else? Or is there a particular style that can be described as continuing to, uh, continuing to characterize Jews post-secularization? OK, it's not payas. I don't see too many payas in this room. I don't see anyone here wearing a shaitel. But I think that if people looked around, they could say there's a kind of Jewish style here. So one of the things that we're asking is, what is the Jewish style? Where do you go once, you, once you're not wearing, the, once you've, you, you've cut off the, the beard, once you've, you, you've taken off the shaitel? So part of my question here is, what is Jewish style, and how do we think about it, more particularly in the case of, let's say, sex? What is secular Jewish sex? What is secular Jewish marriage? What is secular Jewish romance? These are the questions that, um, uh, uh, that I want to ask. And my point of departure is that we're not talking about an abandonment of Jewish law. We're not talking about people stopping to go to the mikvah. That's part of it, yes. But we're also talking about an adoption of an entirely new sexual, marital, social system um, that remains to be described. Um, and that is in flux in this, uh, in this period that I'm talking about. I'm mostly talking about Eastern Europe at the beginning of the 19th century, which is when all the interesting changes are going on. Um, so I'll say one other thing about this, which is I, I would also want to uh, uh, try to, what's the word, try to avoid you thinking in another way, to try to uh, avoid another kind of misperception about Jewish secularism, Jewish secularization. Um, and that's that, uh, in some ways, Jewish secularization, like other kinds of secularization, got very exercised about the same sorts of things that exercise all sorts of battles between tradition and, and uh, secularism or modernization. So what I'm talking uh, women, sex, and the body, bodily practice, turn out to be very often the most contested areas. So you think about, in the case of Islam, the veil. Um, in the case of China, foot binding. In the case of India, uh, uh, self-immolation of widows. So those are the kinds of those are the kinds of heated controversies that a society that's in the process of modernization tends to get obsessed about. Why this is? Why it is that women's bodies are at the center of battles around between tradition and modernization? is a good question that we're not going to be talking about right now. But very often, this particular battle is described as one between an oppressive, a sexually repressive religious tradition and a liberatory, but from the point of view of the traditionalists, an immoral or an amoral sexual liberation. Um, so one side is is too free in their sex, but uh, wants to liberate women, and the other side wants to repress women. Now, I'd say that this is, um, is not the case, is specifically not the case, and this is really something, this, this analysis is something I owe to David. It's not the case in, the, in Jewish secularization in the 19th century for a number of reasons, and that we shouldn't confuse the arguments about women wearing a shaitel with um, modern contemporary arguments about the veil or foot binding or things like that. And I'll, I'll explain why. One of the interesting differences is that um, maskilim, in other words, the intellectual elite, the Jewish reformers, the avant-garde of modernization and secularization, um, the, uh, the ma maskilim are practitioners of the Haskalah, of the Jewish enlightenment. So maskilim, interestingly enough, didn't think of tradition as sexually repressive. 
in some way, or, or not only as sexually repressive, they also thought of tradition as being sexually coarse. And that's something that I have to describe. What does it mean that they accused traditional society of being hypersexual and sexually coarse? Um, in, in the, the two ways of, of looking at this, two interrelated ways of looking at it, one of the things that they thought about traditional society is that in, in terms of how rabbis ran the Jewish world, um, sex was kind of something that was governed according to the same principles that eating, it was a, it was a physical process of which there were laws of what you had to do. It was related to eating and even maybe related to defecation. I mean, it was, it was just a practice. Um, so in other words, they, dis they found it disgusting, as maybe we do, that the rabbis would, find them, would, would often you know, uh, find themselves in the position of talking about a, a woman's underwear in terms of whether she's uh, allowed to her husband or not. They considered the whole discourse of Nida and uh, all of that as just being repulsive and just not uh, respectful of women and not proper. Um, th that's one way in which they considered this, the, the tradition as, as being uh, too physical, um, as opposed to this kind of sublime view of what sex could be, which is what they uh, learned about from European literature and European society, bourgeois European society. So sex was something about, it was about soulmates, it was about, um, it was about a kind of, uh, um, union of, of, this, of, of, of a man and a woman in the highest spiritual sense, um, a man, one man and one woman who were destined for each other, that, that, that kind of thing. And the idea that the rabbis could be talking about bloodstains was just, they wanted to, to get that out of the sex business. They wanted to, 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 to sublimate uh, sex. Another way in which they found the traditional world unbelievably coarse was that the traditional world, and again, this has nothing to do with Jewish law. This is, um, in other words, the traditional world is not exhausted by recourse to Jewish law. It also develops its own cultural practices that don't have that much to do with Jewish law, including the practice of arranged early marriage. Um, which is an elaborate system that, that owes something to Jewish law, but, but, but not everything. Um, so the, the idea that, you, that what, what really bothered them, I mean, many things bothered them about arranged marriage. And in the beginning of the 19th century, there were very, I mean, you read these memoirs from the end of the 18th century, Maimon's memoir, we're talking about 14-year-olds being married off to 12-year-olds. I mean, just children, as soon as they reached uh, pubescence, were married off. So what they found really repulsive about that system is that it treated young boys and young girls as more or less interchangeable. Um, in other words, it matters who the parents are because you want to make a good shidduch between two good families. So it matters who the father is. It matters like how many generations back they are from whatever the rabbi is that they're, they're, they're figuring out their lineage from. But the girl and the boy, they're more or less one girl, one boy. You know, they're more or less just tokens in a chess or pawns in a chess game to get the parents married off to each other, to marry off families. So the idea that, 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 that young uh, boys and girls were, could be substituted for each other, more or less at random, to keep the system going, was something they also found somewhat disturbing. By the way, do you know what it means when a Jewish studies professor takes off her watch? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so on the other, you know, on the other, from the other perspective, it's wrong to think of these masculine as being interested in free love. They were not the kinds of secrets. They were, uh, there were people interested in free loves, and there were radical masculine toward the end of the 19th century that got involved in radical political movements and along with that radical social movements. But the ones at the beginning of this movement were interested in, in, bring, in making the traditional Jewish world, not into an occasion for, um, you know, wild sex, but into proper middle class European um, men and women. Um, and they were actually quite disturbed, this again from the 20th century, but this is a figure, this is a, this is a woman who they're worried about. They're worried about what they're seeing because secularization 
In other words, they, they weren't just trying to move Jews into, sec, into the secular world. They were trying to restrain them from moving too far, and particularly women. They were really worried about these new women. Um, for some reason, the, 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 the woman playing the piano is always the emblem of what's called the false enlightenment, the women that go too far, um, the women that take this secularization thing a little too seriously. Um, they want, what, what they wanted to do is bring women into the orbit of a kind of bourgeois patriarchy out of the rabbinic patriarchy, which meant um, in some ways was more um, intense in terms of gender roles in the traditional world. The traditional world had lots of gender rules, but the gender roles were a little fuzzy, let's say, whereas the bourgeois society, gender roles, what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be a man, that's where the real ideology lies. Um, the Jewish world, did, uh, the traditional Jewish world lacked that ideology. Jewish women came in all sizes, shapes, and types. The main thing was if they went to the mikvah. Jewish men, same thing. The main thing is that they studied Torah. The idea that there is a perfect type of woman, there is a perfect type of man, is something that they inherited along with bourgeois ideology. Um, and the idea that secularization might mean sexual license was terrifying for these ex-yeshiva boys, which is what they all were. Um, and the notion that these women need to be, um, that, that somehow they need to bring women into an orbit of, uh, you know, back into an, an, a new orbit of, of, of social control is something that, that, that we should keep in mind. So what's describing this transformation is that there isn't a movement from sexual, despite the fact that the religious world still calls secular Jews frei or free, right? That's the term for a secular Jew is a frei Jew, which is nice, but I would say it's a little too generous. Um, that what you get isn't a freedom from restraint, but a, a new, let's say, a new choreography of sex and marriage, a kind of, uh, a new bag of tricks you don't have to go to the mikveh anymore. Now you go to the hair salon. Um, it's not that different. Um, now, where did they get these ideas? Now, one of the differences between the Jews of Eastern Europe and the Jews of Germany is that the Jews of Germany could actually look at their bourgeois neighbors um, and, and see how to do it. Um, oh, yes, I, one more slide. This is, an, again, from the 20th century, Abrevele de Kala, the letter to, to the bride. Now, one of the interesting products of this moment of 19th century uh, is, uh, uh, this, I have no idea what this sheet music's about. I just used the image. Because one of the most interesting um, literary products of the early house of the 19th century Haskalah was the romantic epistolary. So it was uh, basically how to write a love letter to your bride, which is like a love letter. Who knows about love letters in the traditional world? So people actually had to be taught how to, I mean, men and women had to be taught who makes the first move, what's the proper language by which to talk to a woman, um, and, and masculine, among other literary genres that they developed, developed romantic epistolaries so that young, again, ex-yeshiva boys, which is what they all were, um, in which you know, they're trained in the laws of nida, they're not trained in the laws of talking to a girl. So they learn how to, they learn how to talk to a girl, um, including the law of you know, the boy makes the first move, which is something, again, that's who knew how to make the first move. It was the parents who made the first move. So um, this is something that was, you know, th this is an example of, of um, a masculine genre of, of, let's say, secularization, Jewish sexual secularization. It's very hard to say, but I managed it. Um, so, so where did the masculine, you know, where, where did they get their ideas from? As I, I was saying, um, in, in, in Germany, there actually was a kind of bourgeois sexual system. Uh-oh. I could see you're all reading ahead. I'm not going to let you do that. So, um, so this is my first PowerPoint presentation, I should say. I'm still learning the ropes. Um, but I know how to talk to a boy. Um, so they, 
so in the case of Eastern European Jews, they lacked the kind of middle class that was available in, in Germany, but in which to actually interact with such Europeans. I mean, there were the nobility that they would have nothing to do with, and then there were the peasants that they sold their goods to. So There's a very, very small, underdeveloped uh, middle class in Eastern Europe. The, middle, the, the idea of becoming European and becoming secular was basically borrowed uh, and learned through literature. Basically, you read novels novels about how to become a modern, a modern person um, and how do you teach other people to become a modern person through literature. So literature, especially the novel. Now the novel, if you remember, the novel in English, we don't hear it, but in many European languages, including Hebrew and Yiddish, the word for novel is roman, romance. Um, the, the novel is about boy meets girl. I mean, you know, this is the sort of archetypal thing. It could be about other things, but this is a particularly beloved thing that the novel is about. Boy meets girl, um, you know, many, 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 many obstacles ensue, and then they lived happily ever after. I mean, that's a novel. Um, now, this is how they learned about boy meets girl and all the obstacles. Um, and this is how they learned about how to get to happily ever after. I mean, and very often it wasn't in, in their own cases because if they hadn't managed to escape from the traditional world early enough, they were already married by the time they were doing this. They'd already missed trying this out in their own lives, um, which is where you get the big problem. So when these Maskilin decide to write literature, and they're writing literature as opposed to philosophy because they're living in a world of the great Jewish masses. They don't want to talk to 200 people, 200 intellectuals, the way people are doing in Germany to join in some philosophical conversation. There's a little bit of that, but they know that the real way to get people including religious people, because everyone wants to read a novel, it turns out, even when the novel is making fun of Hasidim, Everyone wants to read it, including the Hasidim. So everybody loves to read novels. So they get into the novel business, and then they just say, but the, there's a big problem for every one of them, right? Including, you know, Mendel Macher the grandfather of modern Hebrew and Yiddish literature. How do you write a novel when you yourself were married off at the age of 15? Your wife can't even read the language then in which you're writing it if you're a Hebrew writer. Um, you have no experience with anything that would go into a novel. And here's um, the, you know, Mendel's autobiography from the 1890s, I forgot to look up the exact date, where he talks about this problem, but he's not the only one. Shalom Aleichem talks about it, everybody talks about it. You can't write a novel if you are a traditional Jew or even an ex-traditional Jew, and here's why. Dukes, can you read or should I read it? <laughs> Dukes, governors, generals, and soldiers, we were not. We had no romantic attachments to lovely princesses. We didn't fight duels. We didn't dance the quadrille at balls. We carried on with no actresses and prima donna, donnas. In short, we were completely lacking in all those colorful details that grace a story and whet the reader's appetite. In place of these, we had the cheder, the cheder teacher, the cheder teacher's assistant, <laughs> marriage brokers, grooms, and brides, housewives and children, abandoned women, widows with orphans and widows without orphans, this was our life, if you call it a life. <laughs> How do you write a novel if you've never fought a duel? Um, none of these writers ever fought a duel, I can assure you. Um, so there's two ways. There's actually, I would say, that, Yiddish liter that, 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 that the, the modern Jewish literature at its beginnings in Eastern Europe um, had two ways of, of addressing this problem. Way number one, go biblical. <laughs> Avram Mapu, one of the worst novels ever written, though considered the first <laughs> Hebrew novel, Ahavat Zion. So, okay, Jews now, you know, there's Amnon and Tamar, 1853. Oh, I think I said that. Uh, Amnon and Tamar are the two main characters. Um, uh, you know, not the biblical. You know, they're, 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 they're living in the time of the Bible, but they're not the actual brother and sister in the book of Kings or wherever it is. Um, you, someone here must know that by heart. Um, <laughs> So, and, and, and that's them, that's a, 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 a recent addition, but it's, you know, it goes back to the 19th century. Um, and this was an example of how to teach people about Jewish. Go back to the time when there were things like, 
look, no parents, no shatchan, no yichas. These are just, uh, 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 I think Amnon is a shepherd, uh, or she's a shepherd, and they meet because he saves her from a lion, which is hard to arrange in Poland. Um, <laughs> And this is, you know, this is a time when Jewish men were still men, and Jewish women, you know, were perfect and beautiful, had straight teeth. Um, and you can have a, a true romance. Um, other ways of doing it. So this is, this is what I call, and by the way, the going biblical was mostly an option, was mostly the way Hebrew writers went. Um, but it was also an option for Yiddish writers, too, and you have here, I mean, here I'm just showing some of the, I mean, Lillian, some of the, 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 the ways in which the Bible functioned to present new ways of thinking about what is a Jewish man. I mean, I don't know if you could call Adam and Eve a Jewish man or a Jewish woman, but um, I guess Adam and Chava, then they start sounding a little more Jewish. Um, or here's Yahayash with his muse. Um, using the Bible, I won't, I, I just, sort of borrow this image inappropriately. But there is a whole history of going back to the Bible. I mean, David talked about all the uses of the Bible. One of the uses of the Bible was to find Jewish men and women that could serve as kind of models for how to be a Jewish man and woman. Um, you know, Jewish men who rode horses, even if he is wearing a suit. Um, and that, by the way, is Yehoyash, the, the translator, the Yiddish translator of the Bible. Um, Jewish women who, I don't know what she's wearing exactly. She also has wings. I don't know if she counts as a Jewish woman. Um, but these were enormously influential. I'll just talk about two ways. Amnon and Tamar became very popular Jewish names. Um, and one of the things that Jewish, young Jewish boys and young Jewish girls did, and we know this from the memoirs, is that they would go walk in the woods, because this is part of the new culture of nature. All of a sudden, yes, we live in a shtetl, but let's go check out the woods um, as part of this. And the woods is where you can actually hang out with a boy or a girl. Um, and one of the things that you do in the woods, according to the memoirs, is you read Mapu to each other. I don't know how much the... <laughs> The, and literally, you kind of imbibe that kind of language of, of, you know, this kind of weird mixture of biblical language and sort of cheap French novels um, fused together. Um, and, and, and you look at this girl's eyes and you realize she is the one for you. And that's how it happens. Um, so another way in which this happened, so this is one, one, one way. Um, another way is to, 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 I call this, the other, the other one was the high path. This is kind of the low path. The low path is instead of finding um, romantic models that'll somehow teach Jews how to be sexually modern, teach them about romance, you go low. You make fun of them um, by showing them life as it actually is um, in, in Eastern Europe. And The Travels of Benjamin III, is, uh, which was translated into Polish and Russian as the Jewish Don Quixote, is a Jewish parody of Don Quixote in the sense that um, Don Quixote is you know, a man who reads too many romances and he goes off and looking for adventure and for, of course, a girl. Um, in the case of the Jewish Don Quixote, since there is no sh single shtetl man over the age of 15. Um, these are not single men looking for romance, but married men. And what are they looking for? They're not actually looking for romance. They're running away from their wives, their virago wives, because of course, how else would they be going off to have adventures with the, if they were not running away from their wives? Um, and one of them is so terrified of his wife, the one on the left there, that he dresses as a woman in order to, uh, so his wife doesn't recognize him. So instead of saying, okay, this is what it's like to be a, a real man, you say, this is what you guys are really like. Um, these, uh, you, they're completely hapless. They're going off for adventure, but they've never been outside of their shtetl. They basically, the whole novel, they manage to make like one little circle around the shtetl, and they think they're in faraway lands. Um, and, and, uh, and I'll just point out that this is, uh, you know, Don Quixote itself is a kind of parody of romance. Um, so what, this, there is something very odd happened um, with this going low stuff. Um, the going low, what I call the Yiddish parody, making fun of traditional Jews, ended up having um, 
I think, a lot more success than the going high. I mean, I just said Mapu was a very important Hebrew writer, and definitely Hebrew literature, you know, had, uh, you know, successes with the, this kind of positive model of what Jewish romance was. But people loved, they loved the Yiddish literature that made fun of traditional Jews. Instead of being embarrassed to be shown in this light, instead of being shown, you know, to be shown as effeminate men that didn't know how to be real men, that had to dress as women to escape from their wives, that were chasing them with frying pans, right? That's the, people loved this. There was all that, this is what they always say about Yiddish literature. This one of the most popular, the, the big bestseller in the 19th century um, was the Spilish Yingle, which is a, an expose of the Hasidic court. Um, so the Hasidic court is the most corrupt and horrible place, and the Hasidim loved it. That's what you keep reading. That they, well, of course, they knew that they were being made fun of, but everybody just liked seeing themselves more than they like seeing, I guess, these 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 perfect uh, models of what they can be. So that these turned out to be, in some ways, um, the, the the the. Are you telling me I have? To, oh, five minutes. five minutes. Oh my God. Um, so what? So I would say that Yiddish literature turned out to be, um, Yiddish literature turned out to do something unexpected. Although it began in some way as an attempt to correct Jewish tradition, it ended up championing Jewish tradition, not entirely, not completely, in newly transformed secular modes. Um, and I'll give you an example. Even if you go back to this, uh, this particular quote that, that I just read, even here you can see this is supposed to be making fun of traditional Jews, right? Traditional Jews, what do they have instead of duels? They have, uh, you know, cheders and orphans and widows and matchmakers um, and the cheder assistant. Um, even here you see he's also making fun of European culture. You don't want to fight a duel, someone could get hurt. Um, there's a kind of critique of, you know, and really, is it true that every, every secular European Christian non-Jew is, you know, hanging out with princesses and going to balls? That's a fantasy in anybody's life. So there's a, a kind of, even in the critique of Judaism, there's also a critique of European culture. In the case of this novel, it's very, very clear. The novel really starts off making fun of traditional Jews. Um, by the end of the novel, the, it, and, it, and the novel's, by the way, very funny. By the end of the novel, it's not funny at all um, because, and, and the, the, the satirical charge is not against these poor schleps, the way it is at the beginning, but against the, the, against the larger society. What happens is, is that these two get uh, kidnapped into the, into the Russian army, and you can imagine what good soldiers they make. They make such terrible soldiers that they're actually kicked out of the army. And there's no doubt that we're supposed to think that's a good thing. We're Jews <laughs> after all. Yes, we may think we want to fight a duel, but no, we're a little smarter than that. And no, thank you very much, the Tsarist army. We'll go back to our shtetl and live our lives out. Um, so what, what starts out as being a critique of, of Jews ends up really being a critique of European militarism. Um, and that it, the fact that Jews are bad at being soldiers is the best thing about them. What you get is a series, I don't really have time to talk about it, all of a sudden there's this idea in, 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 in many of these Yiddish, uh, famous Yiddish cultural productions, and you can say the same for um, Tevya, there is a kind of move away from the wholesale adoption of European and bourgeoisement as a value. And there are ways in which internal Jewish attitudes um, come back into play. They're tempered by, the, let's, say the, let's say, the religion of romance. The bourgeois religion of mo romance is tempered by, I got it down to three things. A, realism and the demystification of sex. Yes, there's one person out there for us. 
Let's just say that the Song of Songs, the Jewish, the Jewish, the Bible also has these two ways of thinking about sex, right? The Song of Songs, the greatest love poem ever written. It's not what, you know, if you take it as not being about God and the Jewish people, but it's about a young boy and a young girl. Um, the Bible also has that romance, the Bible, but the Bible also, ha and even the story of Jacob and, and Rachel, right? You work, you work seven years to be with one woman who's the best woman, um, who the only woman for you. Um, but the Bible also has, and Jewish culture certainly has, a kind of realism about sex. You know, in the morning, he woke up, and this woman that he'd been working for for seven years turned out it was her sister, and he didn't even know. What do they say? And the cat, in the dark, all cats are the same. We're back to the interchangeability, the basic interchangeability, let's say, of boys and girls and men and women and in the dark. Um, that kind of realism starts to come up in various ways in Jewish literature, and let's call it sort of native Jewish common sense about sex and a kind of skepticism about the sublime romanticism that the masculine loved so much in the 19th century. Um, in the case, sorry, reading a little ahead, another thing is, is, is the, 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 wearing, the, the importance of family and community. This really comes up in Tevye. Yes, the love between a man and a woman, a young boy and a young girl, is the most exciting thing there is. Um, but there also are other kinds of love. There's family love. There's a love between a father and a daughter. Um, those loves are so important in Jewish literature. Those family connections. And the point at which the, the, the love between the, 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 the young boy and the young girl, which always wins in Shakespeare, always wins in Romeo and Juliet, when it comes up to bear against the limits of community, and this is where the, you know, the, the, the big problem of intermarriage comes in, then community sometimes wins. This is what constitutes Jewish, uh, Jewish consciousness, that there is a kind of eros, uh, uh, we could talk about this maybe in the Q&A, in, in, um, in the Dibuk, which says that the, the arranged marriage, in some way, the, the, the eroticism of the chosen person and the eroticism, the excitement of going against your parents' desires to marry specifically the boy they don't want you to marry, as exciting as that is, it's also really nice to find out that, in fact, you were actually promised to each other before you were born, which is a typical plot twist. It happens in Avatzion, it happens in the Dibuk. Every The J Jews want to have it both ways. They want to they want to marry the person their parents hate, that they're attracted to, and they also, that's really exciting, especially for the first few months, and then they want their parents to kind of be part of it, um, too. And then finally, to go back to, to um, Yiddelwitz and Fiddle, there's something about the Jewish community in which women and men, in some ways, were not that interested in that bourgeois gender role. Um, the greatest Jewish screen actress wasn't, you know, okay, Sarah Bernhardt, in the Yiddish-speaking world, was a cross-dresser named Molly Pecan, I'm sure you know. Um, why is it, this is who we wanted. We didn't want to completely absorb the angel in the house, a domestic woman. We want something about that loud Jewish woman that didn't fit into that perfect model, continue to be attractive to the Jewish world. Um, I think this is what you get. You get a kind of distinctly Jewish style from a kind, we're back to David's dialectic. I said we were far away from it. Um, it by the time you get to the 20th century, you get a dialectic between secular Europeanization and native Jewish traditional values, not halachic, but nevertheless cultural, deep cultural patterns that continue to shape secular Jewish culture. I think it's even in Freud. I would say Freud is in this sense, he's in the tradition of the rabbi. It's a kind of, uh, kind of native sense about, let's say, the interchangeability of our one true love with other true loves and maybe any true loves. Um, let's just bring Lenny Bruce into an already sticky situation. And of course, Philip Roth. And I'll just end by saying that even if Jewish secularization 
began through the adoption of European modes of not only dress, as we saw in those first photos, but also attitudes towards sex, gender, and marriage. By the time you get to the mid and late 20th century, it's European literature and world literature that has been thoroughly infused with Jewish values. That without Freud and Philip Roth and Lenny Bruce, you can't imagine world literature. And those people, whether they know it or not, in some ways are expressing the traditional Jewish values that modern Jewish literature began by rejecting. Thank you. Jewish women have not gotten um, a very good press from their Jewish men. Yes. And you think of the, the um, from Mailer and uh, Roth and Malamud, uh, there is, I would say, um, greater misogyny on the part of Jewish men towards their women in fiction, never mind real life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just think that... At least Charlie Sheen's not Jewish. Maybe that <laughs> <laughs> we had more um, women who were writing and being able to be read, it might be another story, and I'm not, and I'm talking historically. Where were the women in Eastern Europe and Wilna writing the novels. So, uh, thank you. I'm being pressed on this issue, and rightfully so, because it's a very important one. Is what you know? What goes so? What goes south between Jewish men and Jewish women in 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 the, the era that I'm describing and sketching out? And there's no doubt that something does. Misogyny. Um, you know, and intermarriage is partly about that kind of the idea that it's not Jewish women that are sexually attractive. Maybe they're sexually attractive to non-Jews, but that's the, the, in some way that there's been a desexualization of the relationship between Jewish men and Jewish women. That no doubt is part of the story. There's also been a way of, um, you know, if secularization is about a certain kind of ambivalence, which I think it it it, it is, then why is it that it's you know, th this is something that Paula Hyman says in her work on gender and assimilation. She says that Jewish women get scapegoated. Um, in other words, there, there's a kind of um, anxiety about the limits of assimilation, which is very often a sexual anxiety because it's about intermarriage, right? Assimilation, acculturation, secularization is great until, you know, there's no more Jews left because they've all intermarried. And that anxiety ends up, um, you know, locating itself again around Jewish women for various reasons, including, you know, either it's Jewish women are impossible, who would want to live with one who, from the male perspective? Uh, or maybe from my, I don't know, from my bisexual perspective. Um, so, you know, the, it, 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 it appears as a kind of eroticization of non-Jewish women um, from, for men. Um, and it also appears as, you know, Jewish women are to blame if Jewish, uh, young Jewish children aren't interested. Jewish women, to some extent, get the burden of carrying on the Jewish tradition when it becomes um, the feminization of the synagogue, when it becomes kitchen Judaism, which is a horrible term that I'm putting in quotes, so I don't, you know, all of a sudden, Judaism gets sort of Jewish, uh, feminine in the 19th century. It's one of the effects of acculturation, just like Protestantism. And then when Judaism is associated with women, and you, you go to synagogue, and I know you don't all go to synagogue, and that's fine, uh, but if you go to synagogue, unless it's an Orthodox synagogue, you'll see there's like a huge preponderance of, of, of women often, and men often say they feel, you know, this is the one place where men were really on top, you know, there were no frying pans in the synagogue, there wasn't half to be behind. Um, somehow, Judaism itself is associated with Jewish women, and, um, you know, the, and with its continuity, Jewish women become, or mothers or wives become, and all the ambivalence about the tradition gets directed against women, which seems unfair for a patriarchal religion. Um, it's a very, this is a very quick, and one of the things that I'm, uh, 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 one of the things that I'm actually interested in is, um, from a completely different perspective, and this is not Paula Hyman's work, but my own, is about the persistence not only of certain kinds of cultural ways of approaching sex and marriage, but also um, a kind of persistent attraction to, to sexual segregation, which is another way of saying traditional community. The traditional community is about sexual segregation. And then the question is, 
you know, and there's a nostalgia. I think one of the reasons why Needle Mitten Fetal is such a popular film is because people feel nostalgic, not only for certain um, sexual and marital aspects of tradition, but also for sexual segregation itself. Um, there's something about, and for community, uh, which, is, which is related to it, um, and that sexual segregation turns out to find, and this is something actually David's written about too, that a lot of these youth movements are ways, sexual segregation is an alternative to the nuclear family. And one of the things that, that uh, people didn't like in the modern world is, I realize I'm talking a lot and I want to hear more questions, so I'll try to do this. One of the things people didn't like is the reduction of erotic and marital life to the nuclear family. There had to be ways out of it. The, the, um, one of the ways was the youth movement. So Zionism, socialism, those were ways of breaking up the nuclear family that were replacements in some ways for the Hasidic court. And I think that this, even within the, the uh, um, Orthodox world, um, feminism had an impact. And one of the interesting things is the rise of a kind of youth, youth movement for girls, especially for girls, um, within the Orthodox world, um, and a as ways of um, capturing some of this energy for the purposes of, let's say, women's solidarity. And I'm thinking about Beis Yaakov and Benos and all those Orthodox youth movements. But it's true also in modern Orthodoxy, B'nai Akiva, Zionism, Socialism, all of those were ways of um, mobilizing sort of quasi-traditional social structures for a new, sometimes traditional, sometimes secular, political and social purposes. I have no idea how far away I got from your question. <laughs> Very far, I think, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, but why don't we just hear, the questions are so interesting. That, why don't we just hear a few questions and I'll shut up. Um, there's another point that, that I think we have, can't forget, which is, maybe it's on the continuum, is what I consider the contemporary cultural degradation of the Jewish mother, or the image of the Jewish mother. Absolutely. Um, let me just add, I recently gave a talk on the role of Jewish women in um, movies, and it's called Mama Drama. <laughs> and uh, as an example, they use come, the title. A come Blow Your Horn, in which the mother is so deprecating, and that was so typical. I think I talked, I mean, I, I, I'm sure there's a lot more to say, but I think I talked a little bit about the role that, the way in which Jewish mothers get conflated with tradition and with restraint, sexual restraint, and how that's played out. But see Freud. I think one more question, maybe. Do you, Naomi, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, did the Maskilim have anything to say about family planning or slash the Jewish mother as a childbearing machine? <laughs> they would go, and I need him. He's read the entire archives. What a good question. Um, you know, the one thing that popped into my head, which might be interesting though, is, is that the, the biographies talk a lot about impotence. Um, but I realize that it has very, well, it's only marginally connected to family planning. I don't know, that's a good question. Okay, thank you it's so much. It's one way of family planning. <laughs> <laughs> we have a brief, uh, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Five minutes stretch, it's not a break, just take a